I praise the Lord for the 25th anniversary of the Gethsemane Bible Presbyterian Church. And surely in an anniversary we, we want to thank the Lord for all that He has done, all that He has blessed us with, how He has used us all these years. It's a time of remembrance, time of thanksgiving, and I rejoice with you. And I thank the Lord also for your pastor, Reverend Dr. Prabhu Das Koshi. In fact, I knew him even before the church was founded. The church was founded in 1988. He came to study in FEBC in 1987. And for all these years, I thank the Lord that we have had very good fellowship and continue to have good fellowship serving the Lord together and he's a fellow laborer, fellow servant in the ministry and I appreciate his ministry service for the Lord in the Far Eastern Bible College and I thank the Lord also for your leaders besides your pastor your two elders, Elder Ma and Elder, Elder Troy and all the deacons and even all you members for I thank the Lord for your unity of faith hope and love for the Lord and you are not ashamed to take a declared position I remember Reverend Dr. Arthur Steele when he taught us in class on contemporary theology in these last days with many many attacks on the Christian faith and on the word of God how the church how Christians must take a declared position he says no point being a secret Christian a dumb dog or dumb donkey and you don't speak out for the Lord we must take a declared position in defending the faith and this church has not been ashamed to take that declared position this is what we believe in accordance to God's word in accordance to God's truth and we are not ashamed of this truth even though it may be unpopular even though we are walking the narrow way even though the majority may laugh and ridicule and scorn and scoff at us because of the truth that we, the stand that we take doesn't matter we want to please God because we believe Him, we love Him, and we want to defend. Defend Him, His name, and His good word. And so it's good that we have this topic this evening. The church, which is a pillar and ground of the truth. And this description of the church is found in... First Timothy, let's turn to our text for this evening. First Timothy chapter three. First Timothy chapter three and verse fifteen. Shall we read together? Verse fifteen, first Timothy chapter three and verse fifteen. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The church is known by many names in the Bible. It's called the body of Christ. This is called the Bride of Christ. It's called the Temple of God. And here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, it's called the Pillar and Ground of the Truth. So what is the church? The word church is used here. The church of the living God. We are the church of the living God, the Pillar and Ground of the Truth. So what does the word church mean? In the original, this word is the Greek word ekklesia. 
That's where we get the word ecclesial or ecclesiastical. Church, ecclesia. And this word in general means an assembly, a getting together. However, please understand that although there is this general sense of the word, it is an, an assembly, a getting together, a congregation, yet in a specialized way, whenever this word ecclesia is used in the context of God's people, it always means a sanctified, separated, a special people of God who are born again, bought by the precious blood of Christ, separated, called out of this world of darkness into the kingdom of God's marvelous light. In other words, this word has the idea of separation. The doctrine of separation is intrinsic to this word, ecclesia, because it comes from two Greek words, the preposition ek, meaning out of, and the word kaleo, which means to call. So literally, this word means called out people, called out ones, separated, a separated people. So when you call yourself Gethsemane Bible Presbyterian Church, you use the term church, understand, that you are a separated people of God, away from this sin-cursed world, and now citizens and members of the kingdom, the holy kingdom of God and of Christ. And don't let anyone tell you that, that this word doesn't mean or has no sense of separation at all. I say this because I was taught in seminary when I was in the States, and the professors there say this word, ecclesia, cannot be used, has no meaning and no sense of separation. It just means a getting together of people, an assembly, and that's all there is to it nothing to do with separation at all and you and we must never use this word to teach the doctrine of separation nothing can be further from the truth the etymology of the word the root word itself tells us it talks about this calling out and in the bible theology comes in as well to inform us of the meaning of this word and in the scriptures Whenever this word is used in the context of God's people, it always must have this meaning that we are called out, a special called out people, sanctified and separated for God's holy purpose. And that's why as a Bible Presbyterian church, we are a separatist church, one of the doctrinal and practical distinctives of the Bible Presbyterian Church is the doctrine and practice of separation. Which is a good doctrine, which is a fundamental doctrine of the Bible. Many churches today, although they call themselves church, they do not practice, neither do they believe in this doctrine. I was from such a church and when I was a student in FEBC I wasn't, I wasn't from the Bible Presbyterian Church I was from another church a brethren church and in teaching the Sunday school I taught this doctrine but one elder of the church chided me and said why do you teach this doctrine it is a denominational distinctive it's only for the Bible Presbyterians only for Far Eastern Bible College to teach and to believe in. It's not for every church or every Christian. It's just for these people, not for us. It's a minor doctrine, so don't major on the minor. Is this doctrine a minor doctrine? 
And it got me thinking. At that time, I was going to write my thesis for my bachelor's degree in a college, and I decided to write on this doctrine to discover, to find out whether separation is a fundamental, a major, important doctrine of the church, of the Christian faith, or not. And so I read from Genesis to Revelation to draw, to see how many verses, how many passages in the Bible that talk about this. And I found that the whole Bible from cover to cover is replete with the doctrine and the practice of biblical separation. Many doctrinal statements, many examples that teach us this is what we must be if we are a church of God, a people of God. And please never despise this doctrine. This doctrine is as fundamental as the doctrine of the virgin birth of Christ the substitutionary atonement of Christ the resurrection of Christ the inerrancy of scripture it should be categorized together with all these doctrines and the church is no church don't call yourself a church if you don't practice if we don't practice this doctrine not just believe but also practice the doctrine of separation So know that when Paul tells Timothy, the church of the living God, Ecclesia, when he used this term, he's using it in a very specialized way. We are a sanctified and separated people of God. And if we want to consider ourselves to be sons and daughters of God, and part of his family, it is vital we, we believe and practice this doctrine. Did not the Lord command us, you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to refer to a number of passages as I go along, and I want us to read the Bible together as well. These are important passages, and some may be already very familiar to us, but it's good for us to remind ourselves and to read such wonderful passages again. Now, we, we know from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Right through to chapter 7, verse 1. This command is not an option. Once you believe in Jesus Christ, you become a member of the church, you must obey this. It is given as a command, it is not an option. So let us read responsibly. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 to 7, verse 1. It says here, Verse 14, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The command of separation is issued five times in this passage. First time in verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. As if that is not enough. Verse 17 it says, it commands, come out from among them. Third command, be ye separate, saith the Lord. Fourth command, touch not the unclean thing. Fifth command, chapter 7, verse 1. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And if we do all these things, then we can call ourselves 
sons and daughters of God. Right? Verse 18. You do this, then I will be a father unto you. Are we not sons and daughters of God? Are we not part of God's family? We are. And God expects this from His children. I've called you out of darkness into my marvelous light. You are no longer citizens of this world, the kingdom, or the world of the devil. You have now become citizens of the kingdom of God and of Christ. I am now your father. You are now my sons and daughters. Behave like citizens of God's kingdom. Behave like I am your heavenly father. And as I am holy and separated from evil or sin, you also must be. And when you do all this, I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And it's good for us every anniversary to remind ourselves that we are a separated church, a separated people under God. When many already, even in the Bible Presbyterian denomination, many BB churches are forgetting and minimizing and disobeying this command. It's very sad. History is going to repeat itself. Denominations that have once started well have down the line after two or three generations become normal, as strong as they used to be. No more as biblical or godly. And some even end up being synagogues of Satan, apostate churches. I pray we do not become like this. We are part of that remnant church that continue to press on in a narrow way. If we are to be the pillar and ground of the truth. And also take note that the church is not just a physical building. When Paul here talked about the church, he is not thinking of the physical building of wood or stone. When the church is is mentioned in the scriptures, it always has to do with people. Not a building, but people. Not wood or stone, but flesh and blood. You, me, those who name the name of Christ who are God's children, who are God's people. That's what the Apostle Paul is trying to say here when he says, which is the church. The house of God is the church and is made up of people, flesh and blood. In fact, you know, in the days of the Apostles, in the days of the early church fathers, in the days of the early church, there were no church buildings. Buildings with steeple and cross. Whenever they think of the church, they think of the community of saints, of called out ones. In the first century, in the second century, there were no church buildings. Church buildings only came in existence in the fourth century. After Christianity found favor with Emperor, the Roman Emperor Constantine. And then churches, buildings called churches, began to be constructed, began to exist. But before that time, there were no church buildings. When you talk about the church, it's talking about people. People who were persecuted. People who were hated by the world. People who suffered a great deal for the Lord Jesus Christ. And in order to live in peace or to worship in peace, worship God in peace, they worship quietly in their homes or secretly in caves. And they were pursued from place to place because of their faith. These were the people. This was the church in those days. 
So when you think of the church, think of the church in this way. That we are people that must be prepared to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. For righteousness sake, for truth sake. It's not about building. And that's why in the book of Hebrews, now turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 37 and 38. Let us read in unison these two verses, shall we? The church in those, in those days, with all the believers in the church, what did they go through? Let us read together. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 37 and 38. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. Were tempted were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. That's what they were. In fact, right now we are very comfortable sitting in cushioned chairs in air conditioned comfort worshipping the Lord in this way in those days they had no such luxury and we must be prepared if one day we have to go through all these things for the sake of Christ and for the sake of the truth please do not think that the goal of the church is to build a building of bricks, of stone. Do you have a building fund? Well, True Life BP Church has a building fund. And some churches, you know, when they start in the very beginning, they start a building fund. And they think that the goal of the church is to build, to have a building of its own. And so they strive year after year to get the money. And their goal is to build this edifice, this physical building that they can call their own. And then when they finally have the building, they say, well, we have made it. We have made it. We have now become really a church. No. This kind of a thinking is foreign to the scriptures. While well, all these 25 years you have been using rented premises. And true life is still using rented premises. We have been worshipping for the last 10 years. Are we any less a church if we do not have a church building we can call our own? We are no less a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Please don't think you are inferior, you are you know, in some way inferior to churches than buildings of their own. Maybe the Lord is more favorable to them or has bless them, it is not bless us because we don't have a permanent dwelling place no, don't think like this the church is flesh and blood not wood and stone a people sanctified separated, special in God's sight it's not beautiful buildings tinted windows High steeples that the Lord is impressed with. The Lord wants us and is pleased with us. If only we will be holy and beautiful and good in our lives. As His church, as His people. As lively stones, the Bible tells us. Not dead stones, wood or stone or marble or brick, 
but living stones, flesh and blood, alive for the Lord, living for Him. Because our God is the living God, and He wants us to be a living church. In 1 Timothy 3.15. So the church of the living God. If the God of the church is living, then He expects the church, His people, to be living as well. Are we alive? Are we alive? Or do we just go through the motions? As Christians, just on Sunday, it's a routine for me. I just come in, I go out, and I just live my, my life in a hum, humdrum way, in a mechanical way, because of custom and tradition, but really no fire, no zeal, no conviction, no passion for Christ. Then it's no use. I'm not saying that it is wrong to pray for a church building, but that is not the ultimate goal and purpose of the church. So this is one thing I want to stress in the light of 1 Timothy 3.15. Church here is a sanctified, a separated, a special body of people characterized by godliness and holiness, characterized by truth, called out from the sinful world into God's holy kingdom for His holy purpose. So please, first of all, understand this. And I like what Paul here says when he referred to the church as the house of God. The house of God. Now, the term house of God in the Old Testament refers to the temple. To the temple, which is a holy place. In a holy location, in Jerusalem. And the Jews, the Israelites were commanded to Assemble to go to Jerusalem and to go to the temple to worship the Lord. And the temple is also called a house of prayer. To worship and to pray and to offer sacrifices unto God. And it symbolizes God's presence. But in the New Testament, the church is now to be understood no longer as a place, but as a people again. A people. Flesh and blood. For this we, we know from what Jesus said in John chapter 4. We turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4 verse 21 to 24. Let us read these verses together, shall we? Look at what Jesus said and what he told the Samaritan woman over here. John chapter 4 verse 21 to 24. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now it is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so the church can worship the Lord anywhere and everywhere today. We don't have to go to Jerusalem. We don't have to go to the temple. In fact, there's no more temple today. We are the temple. The temple of the living God. As living stones, spiritual house, we are the ones. And right now, when we meet together in this way, we are a house of God offering sacrifices of praise, just like what the young adults did just now. We also sang, 
we are doing what in the Old Testament the Israelites were doing in the temple. We are serving, worshipping and serving the Lord in this way. Not in just this location of this place now, in every place, in any place. And this place, this auditorium has become a sanctuary. Sanctuary. Each time God's people meet, when we pray, when we open the scriptures, we read, we meditate and we sing praises to the Lord and worship Him and even serve and give our tithes and offerings to Him while well, this place has become a sanctuary because of the people that are in it. And that's why also Peter said in First Peter, if you look at First Peter chapter 2, Verse 5 says here, Ye also as lively stones, living stones, are built up a spiritual house. So we are the house of God. Right? A spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And then in verse 9 we read, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a generation, uh, uh, sorry, a, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is the meaning of the church, and this is what the church is and must do. So please, know this well and understand this. And may the church, and if the church is such a spiritual house of God and we are living stones, make sure the church is characterized by things spiritual, things biblical. The church should not be reduced or should not become a community center with cooking classes and sewing classes and karate classes the churches which organize such meetings no different from a community center a church is not like this and the activities are, of the church are not these activities church should not degenerate into a entertainment hub with full of rock and roll music and dancing and many churches have become like this. A church should not degenerate into an integrated resort, which is a den of thieves. A church should not become a country club just for the elite and exclusive members only, you know, only members have privileges. A church must not be such a club, but a place where the lost can come in and hear God's word and see God's people living out their lives in such a way that they would desire to have this kind of a life that, that they are living. They don't find it in the world, but they can see it in the church and they want to belong to this family. We must be this kind of a church. And in 1 Timothy chapter 3.15, Paul went on to explain that the church is the pillar, the pillar and the ground of the truth. Pillar and ground of the truth. What is truth? What is truth? In John 17, verse 17, let's turn to John 17, 17. Jesus makes a very, very clear statement here. What is truth? John 17, verse 17. Jesus, in his high priestly prayer, prayed to his Father, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word. 
Thy word is truth. God's word is truth. Now when Paul talked about truth in 1 Timothy 2.15 pillar and ground of truth it's not just truth please take note it is the truth the pillar and ground of the truth so please correct your leaflet or your program sheet here the title a pillar and ground of not just truth it's a pillar and ground of the truth, the truth. In the original, the definite article, the word the, is connected with the word truth, aletheia. So it is literally the truth, not just truth. In other words, Paul is not referring to truth as something that, in a qualitative sense, right, in terms of of it as a quality. When Paul talks about truth here, because it is used with a definite article, he uses it with a definite article, the, he's talking about truth as the object of our faith. The truth. The word of God. The whole counsel of God. The holy scriptures. The 66 books of canonical scripture. All the fundamentals of the Christian faith. The truth. And we are pillar and ground of the truth. The word of God itself. We are not just called to be a truthful people. Christians ought to be truthful. The church ought to be truthful. But we are a pillar, we are described as the pillar and ground of the truth, the objective truth. Not just truthful people, characterized by truthfulness, which is a quality. We are to be people who believe with all our heart, soul, mind and strength, the truth, which is the word of God. And when we say we are believers of the Word of God, please make sure you are truthful and sincere about it. It is all of the Word that you believe in. Not part of the Word. <coughs> Only those words that I like, I believe. Those words I don't like, I don't believe. I throw out. The church cannot be a pillar and ground of the truth if it believes in such a way. It's really not belief, it's unbelief. And that's why the Firestone Bible College, we take the Dean Burden Oath, and I'm sure you also believe in this statement of faith with regard to the Scriptures. Our faith on God's Word that the Bible is none other than the voice of him that sitteth upon the throne. Right? Every book of it, every chapter, every verse, every word, every syllable, every letter is the direct utterance of the Most High. The Bible is none other than the Word of God, and not some part of it more, some part of it less, but all alike the utterance of him that sitteth upon the throne, faultless, unerring, supreme. And God's people say, Amen. But sad to say, there are those in the church who say, Oh yeah? Really? Every word? And today, people, I, I'm so amazed. Those who call themselves Christians, even those who say they are fundamentalists, believe in the fundamentals of the scriptures, they say, we don't have all of the words of God today. Some words have been lost, others have been corrupted, but thank God we just have the truths of the scriptures, the doctrines, the concepts, but we don't have all of the words that God had originally given to us. Does this sound like God? Speaking, does God teach us like this? 
and tell us that we today in the 21st century do not have the whole word of God to the last jot and tittle. I don't see my God telling me that at all. In fact, I hear him so clearly in Matthew 5 verse 18. Jesus said, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot, one tittle, shall no wise pass from the Lord till all be fulfilled. I take him at his word. And he meant every word, and he meant it literally. And I believe my God is a very, very powerful God. And what he has promised to do, he has the power to fulfill, and I believe he has fulfilled and kept his promise. And by the logic of faith, we can tell where the Word of God is today, what is the Word of God, which is the Word of God. We also have the infallible guidance of the Spirit within us as well. And that will lead us to the truth. And yet there are those who cannot believe this. And if you believe this, and you're dogmatic about it, they say, Thus said the Lord is written, everyone, every Christian must believe this. They say you are a heretic. It is heresy. We are living in perilous times indeed. When we hear such things from the mouth of those who call themselves Christians and who are found in the church. One pastor told me, I have to re-examine what Jesus said in Matthew 5.18. Jesus didn't mean what he said because I... I see there are mistakes out there, mistakes in the Bible. Not many, a few, they are not significant. And so now I must re-examine what Jesus said in Matthew 5.18, jot and tittle, doesn't mean jot and tittle. And this pastor is not some liberal pastor, he's supposed to be a fundamental Bible Presbyterian pastor, talking like this. And there was once I asked him a question. If a young Christian would come up to you and ask, Pastor, is my Bible perfect or not? Infallible in end, no mistakes. Says my answer to him will be, The Bible has no mistakes that should cause you any worry. That was his answer. Do you know what it means by that statement? very clever way of saying the Bible has some mistakes, but the mistakes are insignificant, you don't have to worry about, about them, you, I mean it can be generally trusted how can the church be a pillar and ground of the truth a pillar and ground of truth if we believe in the Bible like this better not call ourselves a church, Paul says it is a pillar and ground of the truth And how can the church be the pillar and ground of the truth when we are not sure of God's word? We're not certain of God's word. We even doubt His word, question His word, criticize His word, and even say the Bible is not 100% infallible in there. Well, maybe 99%. And I will give you up to 99.9, but don't say 100. Don't say 100. You say 100%, they want to crucify you. Why? But Paul says the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. Thy word is truth. And this truth comes from God who is 100% infallible in error. Then how can the word that he has given to us, the word from his mouth, be any less 100% infallible in error? It's a very, very sad and disturbing situation we find ourselves today. And when Paul here talks about the church being a pillar, a pillar, the Greek word is the word stulos, 
and it's used four times right, in the New Testament. And it has the idea of a strong and steady support. It's a column. You know pillars are columns? Strong, huge columns that support the weight of the building or the roof. Well, that's what we are supposed to be. Has the idea of strength here. And it's not enough just to be a strong pillar or strong column, a supportive column, a strong supportive column of the truth. Paul used another term, ground. And the Greek word here is hedrioma, hedrioma, which means foundation. You can also translate it as foundation. So it's not enough just for the church to be strong in its pillars, the upright supportive columns. The foundation, the ground and the foundation must be equally strong as well. No point having a strong pillar, but the foundation is weak. The building will collapse. The pillar must be strong. The foundation also must be equally strong. And the word here, ground or foundation, has the idea of steadfastness, of strength, just like the word stulos. But it also has the, when the, this word foundation is used, it also has the idea of certainty. Right? Certainty. It's something fixed. The foundation is something that is fixed and firm, sure and certain. You cannot move it. It is unmovable. The church must be like this. The church must be like this pillar, this foundation. Very strong, very steady, very firm, very sure, very certain of the truth and will not waver, will not move, no matter what happens. The whole world may be, again, may be against the truth, but the church will remain firm. There may be a huge earthquake all around. A powerful attempt to destroy the truth. But the church must be full of faith hope and love in Christ and His Word that we remain steady and immovable. We hold our position. We hold our place. We don't retreat. We don't compromise. We continue to hold fast the Word of life no matter what happens. That's what Paul is telling the Christians to do, the church to do and to be when he used these terms pillar and ground. And how can we be such pillars and foundations of the truth when we say, I don't know whether the Bible is 100% or not. In fact, I don't even believe it. How can we be this pillar? There's already a crack in the pillar. There's already a broken foundation. How can the church stand if it doesn't believe that the Bible is 100% perfect? without any mistake. Cannot. And that's why we take an unequivocal stand for the verbal and plenary inspiration of the Scriptures as well as the verbal and plenary preservation of the Scriptures. And I'm not ashamed of it. Why? Because the Bible is so clear. You know, we believe in the verbal plenary inspiration on the basis of just one verse in the Bible, 2 Timothy 3, 16, right? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And on the basis of this one verse, clear verse, we believe the Bible is 100% inspired. If we can by faith believe this, then there should be no problem for us believing that the Bible is equally 100% preserved. In fact, there are a whole lot of verses in the Bible, not just one verse, no less than 50 verses in the Bible that teach the perfect preservation of the Scriptures because God is the one who does it and God makes no mistakes. That's why the Westminster theologians in penning a statement of faith says God's Word has been kept pure 
throughout the ages by his singular care and providence. That means God said, I don't need you. I'll do this work myself. This preservation of his words. We have read Matthew 5.18. Psalm 12, 6 and 7 is another good verse. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them. The words, not just the doctrines, not just the truths, not just the gospel, not just the concepts, but the words, every word, to the last jot and tittle. I'll keep them, I'll preserve them from this generation. For how long? Forever. God says, said it. Well, that settles it and we, our duty is simply what? To believe. And then when we believe by faith in God's promise, then we begin to see how this can be. Then we can interpret the facts and the evidences out there and history with God's mind, with God's eyes, from God's perspective. And then we see things so constant and consistent, so wonderful and so beautiful in the way God works things out in time and space, even in our lives. And then He gets all the glory. The church must be this, the pillar and ground of the truth. So, take a declared position. Don't be ashamed of it. And I'm glad you take this declared position in your church constitution, in your church publications, the Bible witness, and through your web radio, through the pulpit ministry. Thank God for all this Keep on taking this declared position through all the ministries that God has entrusted to your care. And use all these to the glory of His name. Then there is this purpose. Usefulness for Gethsemane BB Church. Not only for this year, but for many years more to come until the Lord returns. Or else, why do we exist? For what? No point, right? If we are not convinced or convicted, we, are, we don't believe and are not persuaded of all these things that are spoken in God's Word. And we are told to be the pillar and ground of the truth and we don't believe this truth. This very basic and fundamental truth of God's word itself. We'll talk about other fundamental doctrines. This basic doctrine of His word, whereby we get all our doctrines and we already, the very cornerstone, we reject. And how can the building stand? How can we be a pillar and ground of the truth? We can't. But we can. If we keep on believing and trusting in Christ and His Word, and the church must not be, if the church is going to be a pillar and ground of the truth, it must not be flexible. It cannot afford to be flexible or fickle. The church cannot be flexible and fickle. It must be strong, firm, sure, unmovable. Because God is like this and His Word is also like that. And I pray the Holy Spirit may impress this upon your heart and your mind. This very auspicious and landmark year of the church. I pray you will not forsake the Lord or backslide from Him, but you will rededicate your life. And you tell the Lord, Lord, I want to follow you all the days of my life. I will not let you go. I will not depart from thee. And you covenant with God, I'm going to walk with you. All the days of my life, all the way until the Lord Jesus returns. If it's another 25 years. But I believe the Lord has come back very soon. We may not have 25 more years. But let us occupy 
live out our lives like this as the pillar and the and ground of the truth until Jesus returns. The Lord bless you and may Lord, the Lord continue to use you to the glory of His name. Let us pray.